Hallelujah. What a, a, a presence. What a presence. Just be a few moments in quietness before God and soak in the atmosphere and the presence of the Lord God. Daddy, we thank you for the sweet atmosphere. We thank you for your presence. That is awesome in this place. And indeed, we love you because you are the best thing that ever happened to us. And this afternoon, we are asking also that uh, you will help us to love you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Minister Cheko and the choir. Haven't they been good? Oh, come on, I appreciate them. Hallelujah. Yeah. And uh, it's powerful also to have with us, uh, you know, Pastor K has got a twin brother, isn't he? Uh -huh. the, Pastor K says that because of persecution, that's why he was a bit shorter. And the brother was more taller, isn't he? And today we have with us, the, Pastor Yusud is in town, but... Uh, because he's ministering somewhere, he's not able to be with us. But we praise God that we've got his representatives here. Yeah. His children are with us. You know, Archie, come on. We want to appreciate you. Angus, come on. Come on. And Adua, yeah, 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 yeah. We love you, yeah? You are at home. God bless you. It's good to have you with us. Last week, Angu, uh, Archie was here as well. Yeah. yeah we bless God for uh, this afternoon. And I just want to share with us uh, a few thoughts, which I think is so, uh, for me, it's one of the things that uh, every, every young person uh, should be thinking about on a regular basis. And uh, even, I don't know what stage in of life you are in, it is something that you need to be considering and exploring all the time because it's an aspect of the life of God that we need to know more about. The nature of God is such that there are certain things that causes God to act on the behalf of a man in such ways that is beyond uh, understanding. So God seems to, in scriptures, seem to tag on with some people in a deep way. Uh, sometimes even at certain points overlooking some of their uh, idiosyncrasies. But most of the time, we also find that God is so much cross to some people, and you think that, you know, what they did is not as, as bad as, uh, and I'm trying to draw us into the uh, 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 Saul and Paul, uh, uh, what is it, uh, David here. But the important point is, what separates God's response to uh, everyone that he considers his children? Why does he respond very positively to some and uh, sometimes uh, so much negatively to others. It is the nature of God, uh, one key in nature of God that is so key that I want to share with us today. And uh, I think uh, uh, I'd like to read a few scriptures uh, in, uh, before I start. But then, uh, so let's go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And I'm going to introduce some characters that uh, we need to take note of. Are you, are you there? And let's start with uh, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priest cast them with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged uh, flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the uh, flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came. Who came there and, bef and also before they burned the fat the priest servants will come and say to the man who sacrificed 
Give me meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you by raw. And the sixteen. And if the man said to him, They should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer him, No, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Can you hear that? For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And uh, also come with me to um, uh, I think verse, uh, verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not good, a good report that I hear. You make the lost people transgress. What a sad situation. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who, inter who would intercede for him? And uh, come with me to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then, if then I am your father, where is my honor? And if I am your master, where is my reverence? Say yes, the Lord of hosts. To you, priest, who despise my name, yet you say, in what, in what way have we despised your name? And then lastly, to the New Testament, John chapter 8 and verse 29. I promise you that will be the last scripture. But I want you to mark these scriptures out because I think they are important. Verse 28 and verse 29. Verse 28 and verse 29. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man... Then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my father taught me, I speak these things. And he, he, and he who sent me is with me. The father has not left me alone, for I always do things that please him. What a bold statement. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Yeah. So I just basically briefly want to share with us um, uh, uh, a sermon that I have entitled as a, titled as a Honoring God. And I believe that honoring God is a key, a key part of our Christian life. And I want to tell you a story before basically I continue. You know, I don't know how many of us have watched this film before, The Chariots of Fire. Chariots of Fire is a, an interesting film. Young people, if you've never watched that before, I know it's an old film. I'm quite confident there might be an updated version of that. Look out for that film and watch it. It will transform your life. It is a story of honor. A young man called Eric Lidl. And this is a real story. It is not a basically a fiction. It's a story. And uh, he, was, uh, he loved the Lord. He was a uh, somebody who took the things of God very seriously, but also a good runner. And in those days, it wasn't 100 meters and uh, 400 meters and stuff like that. It was 100 yards and uh, 400 yards and stuff like that. And uh, so there was going to be an Olympics in France. This is 1924. And uh, uh, so this guy has been running for the 100 uh, yards race for, on behalf of the UK. And so uh, he was selected to be the key runner 
with another guy called Harold Abraham. And so uh, they took off to France. But when they got there, you know, the schedule for the 100 years race was actually changed. Uh, um, so uh, some of the uh, uh, hits and the races, I think the final was going to actually be run on Sunday. And uh, Eric Lido took his Sabbath very serious. He felt that that was a, a testament of his commitment to God. And so he was faced with whether to run on a Sunday and to dishonor God. I know what most of us would, would do and say this, uh, in, this uh, in our day, but this was in, in those days, they took the Sabbath seriously until Margaret Thatcher come, came and twisted you know, that now people go to, you know, you, people don't separate Sunday from any other day. But I hope that uh, for myself, I take the Sabbath of God very seriously. And now, so we see, there was a lot of pressure from the press, from the Prince of Wales at that time, not our current Prince of Wales, was seriously on this guy to change his convictions and run the 100 uh, years race. But uh, Eric Lido was so serious of his convictions and to honor Christ that he chose not to run on the Sunday. And so this is a man who has trained for years for this Olympics. You know how the athletes do their business. I'm really looking at, and the Olympics is the highest uh, place where you actually show off your abilities. And now he had to make a choice between honoring God or honoring his nation, and uh, Eric Little, as the story goes, chose to honor Christ. So he didn't run the 100 race. And so uh, that was the possibility of gold gone. And then um, uh, as time uh, went on during the Olympics, they suggested to him to run a 400-yard race. Obviously, they, they thought that they would respect him because he has uh, trained so hard and so forth. So it was a compromise. They, nobody expected that he would do well in the 400 years race. And, but just before the race, some American trainer who was also a Christian slipped into his hands. This passage which we just, uh, uh, I'm about to read, and then we continue, is 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 30, and it says that those that honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me, I will lightly esteem. And so what God is telling us is that uh, honoring him is a key part of his life. You know, the thing about it is that I was saying in the first service that uh, all of us here, gathered here, are the children of God. If you have given your life to Christ and you have started a walk, a walk with him, you are his child. But as to whether you will be great or small in the kingdom depends on your response to God in this area that we are talking about, honoring God. And uh, the point is, you know, um, if this guy, you know, uh, er Eric Lido, you know, when he was given the 400 yard race, nobody gave him the chance. But when this verse was slipped into his hands, it seems to have done him some, what is it, giving him some more energy. So he, the race, uh, went ahead, and uh, he won the 400 years gold, not even silver. He won the gold. And so almost instantaneously, the, uh, you know, the, the depth of his sacrifice was honored by God almost instantaneously, which shows that if you honor God, he will also do what? He will honor you. And that is an underpinning message I want to give. Never forget this. So, you know, um, it is important for us to realize, just as I said a minute ago, you know, it is great to serve God. God is a great king. He is a good God. And let's, let me tell you, uh, when you, you read Ephesians chapter 3, and I think, uh, uh, verse, uh, I think verse 11, it talks about that God has got a grand purpose. And you, I, every person here, you know, God has got a big chunk of the action for you. Are you with me? God has got a big place for you in his grand purpose. But the, the point is, God is quite, you know, <laughs> very selective. 
God doesn't just use any vessel. And I, I just want you to come with me to uh, uh, one, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, I want to show you something there. Chapter 2, 2 Timothy. Chapter 2 and uh, verse 20. Are you there? And also, that verse is very, very important. It helps some of us growing up. Verse 20. But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver. You see, God is great, isn't it? And his house is what? A great house. Because God is the richest above all. And said, but in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for what? This honor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And then he tacks it on with verse 22. Flee also. Youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the name of the Lord out of a, a pure heart. In some translation, it says, out of a sincere heart. So, listen, God wants all of us in His grand purpose. He wants all of us to participate in that grand purpose. But the, 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 the thing about God is this that God, because of his nature, because of his greatness, you know, let me say this. The grace of God, nobody can understand. How he chooses us to, come, to become his children, nobody can explain. His mercy, forgiving our sins, some of us, the things that we did, and bringing us and loving us the way he does, nobody can ever tell. But as to who God uses, it is his prerogative. And I'm telling you, God is very selective in the one he uses. And I think that the underlying principle that God actually underlines before he selects anybody to use is this word, uh, this title, the honoring of honoring God. If God is going to use you, if God is going to select you, it is those who honor him. So it is very important for us to understand what does it mean to honor God? What does it mean to honor God? You see, to honor God, as I checked in the dictionary, means about three words that are almost meaning the same thing, but they give a slight emphasis. The first one is to glorify. The next one is to promote. And the next is to make great. So if you honor God, it means that you are glorifying him with your life. If you uh, honor God, it means that you are promoting his interest with your life. If you love God, it means that you want to make God great. You want to make God proud. You know, wherever you go, when people see you, they can say that ah, you have made God what? Proud. You have made him great. God is looking for people like that. So God, to honor God, therefore, is the knowledge and understanding that actually focuses your heart and your attention on promoting God and making God great in your life. And that is a challenge for all of us. It's, a, it's your heartbeat about glorifying God. It's your heartbeat about making God great in your life. It's your heartbeat about lifting his name above every name. And if that is your vision, God promises also something. It's amazing that God puts us on the same plane like him. He says that if you honor me, I will honor you. In other words, God is saying this. If you promote me, I will do what? I'll promote you. Yeah? If you, you, uh, you, know, if you glorify me, I will also do what? You, you and I, God says he will glorify you. It's amazing, isn't it? And if you esteem me, I will do what? I will esteem you. And so this is the message God is giving to us. And I believe that it is timely, particularly for, for the young ones. It is very, very important that as a young age, at a, 
uh, as a, at, a, at a young age, you decide to make up your mind that uh, your life will be about, and I'm not talking about never messing up, that's not what I'm talking about, but at the heart of your heart is that whatever it takes, I will promote God in my life. Whatever it takes, I will make God great in my life. Whatever it takes, I will glorify God in my life. And I wouldn't be surprised if you aim to do that, that you too, God says, I will glorify you. I will promote you. And I will make you great. And that is what happens. Now, what does it mean to actually, I've, I've told you what it means. But what are the practical steps that you and I need to take to ensure that we are honoring God? We are glorifying him. We are promoting him. Everyone who wants to promote God must be a servant, foremost. Everyone who, who wants to be promoted by God must be a servant. Because Jesus himself said that I did not come to be Lord, but I came to give my life as a ransom word for many. And he is the chief of servants. And if you want to be great in the house of God, you must begin to live like a servant. It means that, you know, you deliberately choose to serve others. It means that when, you know, people are competing for positions, you are competing to serve. And, as, uh, you know, someone also who honors God is somebody who is also very sensitive to the things of God. We are told that uh, somewhere as a child, even at night watches, when he's sleeping, he heard the voice of God three times. And I think that God may have been speaking with the, with the tone of Eli. So that to see whether this, this young man will be sensitive enough to pick what was happening. You know, he missed it the first, he missed it the second. When he went back the third, Eli helped him to go back and say, Lord, speak, your servant hears. And you see, the point is that if it were me, if it were some of us, the first one, okay, we will wake up. But the second one, I will sleep it. I'll sleep it off, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I won't wake up for Eli's voice. I will sleep it off. Okay, but then because of his sensitivity, what happened? He tapped into the voice of God. My challenge to us is this. You know, to be able to honor God, you need to be sensitive to the things of God and sensitive to the voice of God. You see, God is a king. You know, and you know that you don't go to the uh, royal house and, you know, particularly the queen, the queen uh, in, of this country, you know the royals, when they are speaking, you know their tonation. They don't want to speak at the top of their voice, isn't it? So you don't want, when you go to see the queen, you know, you don't want her to be uh, speaking like some of us, you know, when we were back there in the place, you know, hey, Charlie. <laughs> no, that is, not, you know, so you need to be sensitive to the voice of God. And also, you know, young Samuel was, uh, as we see in the scripture, verse 21, Practice the presence of God. You know, he, he, you know, he took it as, a, as something precious, the presence of God, constantly in the presence of God. And when I'm saying that practicing the presence of God, it's not only when you come to church. You know, in your private life, is there a particular place you have set apart to honor God in your heart? Where when you, you, know, you can go there and really speak to God and allow God to speak to you. Have you got a space like that in your life? Practicing the presence of God. And not only that, he also grew in the knowledge of God. Listen, uh, as we will see later, the sons of Eli, because of their lack of knowledge, because of their ignorance, they never knew the ways of God. But somewhere grew from grace to grace because he began to know and grow in the knowledge of God. And by growing in the knowledge of God, he increased in life. If you want to increase in life, you have to go on increasing in the knowledge of God. And sometimes it seems like people are forcing some church members 
to know the word of God. My challenge is this. If you are going to be any useful in the hands of God, you must know the priorities of God. You must know the preferences of God. You must know what really God desires and wants from you. And until you begin to be a, a Bible student yourself and dig out. You see, preaching like I'm preaching now can only stay you for moments. Are you with me? But listen, you know, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you the word of God is something that you need to develop yourself. Nobody can take that place. And you need to come to that place of experiencing the presence of God and coming to grips and knowing God for yourself. And Jesus, as we learn from uh, John 8, verse 28 and 29, he pleased his Father in every way. And I think it's an amazing testimony of the life of Jesus Christ, that he listened to God in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. You know, uh, last week, uh, uh, our son, uh, Pastor Godlove, was uh, preached a powerful message talking about, you know, Jesus, about his assignment uh, uh, in the Father's house, what he said, that uh, should I not be about my father's business? You remember? Yeah. You see, but we read in this scripture that immediately he went with the mom and dad back to Nazareth, and we were told that he became subject to them, which means that he respected them, he honored his parents. You know, so my challenge is this. You know, honoring God must translate into every area of our lives. Okay? <laughs> Young people, you must respect your parents. You must honor them. You must, you know, because listen, you see, if God is saying that he is our father and he is the one that we must honor, why? Because he created you and I, isn't it? And he brought you, uh, he gave you eternal life through his son Jesus Christ. Do you know that your mom and dad are also, in some way, physically responsible for your coming into this world. You know, so God says that, you know, honor them as well. Not only that, but God speaks into families as well. He says that, you know, <laughs> women, respect your husbands, isn't it? You know, in the Greek word, it's the same way of, the same word that is translated honor. In other words, you know, <laughs> if you are married and you consider yourself married, you must honor your husband. As unto the Lord. Whether the man does not deserve it, the Bible is saying you must honor who? Your husband. Of course, husbands, you need to respect your, uh, you need to uh, love your wives as well. But every woman who really wants to honor God and wants to be great in the house of God, you must honor your husband. Otherwise, you are not honoring God. Because this is the word of God, isn't it? The set, other set of people that you must honor is the men and women of God. Because also, spiritually, they are responsible for your lives. And I don't have the time here to make quotations, but it is listed several places in Scripture. Anyone who is a child of God and wants to be great in the house of God must first honor the men of God that God has chosen over their lives. If you don't honor the ministry of Pastor Kingsley, I'm telling you, he can preach uh, you know, brimstone from and glory from heaven, it will not impact your life. But it is important that you honor his ministry. If you honor his ministry, God will do what? Will also make you great, just like he has made him great. You know, so it is very important that in every sphere of life, you know, where there is authority links, there is a need. God is teaching us that if we honor him, then we must honor people that he has placed in our lives who are also very important. What does it mean to despise God? And this one, I will just use an illustration, which I use in the morning. Um, in this country, we have two key important people, uh, uh, David Cameron and the Queen, isn't it? The Queen is ceremonial head for this nation. And uh, uh, Cameron is an executive Hey, okay, he makes sure everything happens. But you see, any function they go to, Cameron, if the queen is going to be there, Cameron must be there first. 
Because it is impolite for the queen to go and wait on Cameroon. It is never done in this country. Where the queen sits must always be distinct from where Cameroon sits. Nobody will allow Cameroon to sit in the seat of the queen. It, 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 and so that is the way God is saying we must treat him. You see, <laughs> anytime you make a choice and you place God second, you are treating him like, you know, making John, uh, Cameron number one. You understand what I'm saying? Every time you are making a choice between anyone, that is why Jesus says that, you know, to be my disciple, you must, you know, you must choose me above your mother, your wife, your children, okay? Nobody can be my servant unless he chooses me as a priority. He's not saying go and hate him, no. But what he's saying is that, prioritize everything that concerns him. So when you are, coming to, you are coming to an area when you are getting married, is God your priority? Are you thinking about, you know, what will make God happy? Or you are just thinking about satisfying your desires and your wants? So it's always a choice. And I'm telling you, I wish I can tell you, you know, one choice and that is it. Every time there's going to be a season where God will challenge you with two choices. Either prioritizing him or prioritizing yourself or people, key people in your life. And any time you choose others above him, I'm telling you, you are bringing yourself what? Down. You are not promoting God. And God will never promote anybody who brings him down. Is that clear enough? And so when we are despising God, what we are doing is that we don't take time to know God. Because if you don't know the ways of God, how can you know his priorities? what he wants and what he doesn't want. And so knowing God and knowing his will is a key part of that. And I think that uh, you sell yourself cheap if you are just always listening to secondhand messages. God wants to speak to you as a child. And uh, seriously, I can never be serious than this. I, every one of us here need to take God's word serious for themselves. Because in this day, there are so many words going out. You know, I quite remember Pastor Isu came here and he spoke, speak the word. You know, it's not everybody who is speaking the word. And you need to be a Bible student yourself. You must make sure that whenever you hear any message which is inconsistent with the word of God, you will be able to cross it out immediately. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, and if you don't know the ways of God, guess what will happen to you? Because you will be transgressing all the time. And people who transgress the laws of God all the time are called wicked. You want to be a wicked person? No. So you must know God's ways yourself and understand God's ways yourself. Practicing, you see, and if you, if, if, you, know, you despise God, it means that with your life, you are practicing and promoting irrelevance of God. You are causing people not to respect and honor God with your lifestyle. And would you want to be say that others to say that your lifestyle is dishonoring God? No. So the way sometimes we need to change our ways. And honestly, I couldn't. I don't think I want to apologize to anyone. You know, you must watch your life. Is your life pleasing to God or is not pleasing to God? And it's, 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 you know, now we must speak truth to one another. It is not everything that goes. I'm telling you, God does not just accept anything. God has some standards, and he honors some standards. And I wish to, that the mercy of God will help all of us, and his grace will help all of us to prioritize God above everything else. So the children of Eli were promoting sexual perversion. You know, right at the entrance of the tent of meeting. You see, when God brought Israel to uh, the land of Canaan, one of the things they used to do before he brought Israel there was that in their shrines, they, were, they had what they call shrine prostitution. Where, you know, you know, they practice everything around the gods that they have. And now, the God of all creation, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the most high God, in his tent of meeting, the children of Eli had the audacity right outside the tent of meeting, to be doing the same thing 
that the Canaanite did that God, made God to drive them out of the land and brought the people of Israel there. Practicing sexual perversion right in the nostrils of God. And as a church, we need to be very careful and walk in holiness and purity. I believe that holiness is not an old language or old vocabulary. It is the most modern word you can ever find anywhere. Because holiness is eternal, is eternal. God says that I am holy, therefore be what? Holy. Ellie esteem his children. And this one I'm hitting home with parents. Sometimes we honor our children more than God. Some of the things that we will promote our children to do. Some of us, we can't, we don't want to tell our children right from wrong because they don't like it. I'm telling you, if you don't tell them because you are afraid of them, the way they did to Eli, you know, this is not a prophecy. This is what the word of God says, isn't it? The, the same thing, the, the way you help them to treat God, they will also treat you what? The same way. So, please, in love, in love, put your foot what? Down. For the sake of their eternal destiny. Don't be a wishy-washy parent. Let your children know you love them. Of course, I don't like the way some of the time, some of the people from somewhere I know treat their children. No, they just slap them with no apparent reason. No, 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 that is, you know, that is uh, just satisfying your, you know. <laughs> that is bullying, isn't it? But I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, creative parenting. Changing the lifestyle of your children without even them knowing. Challenging them, you know. I had to find a way of teaching one of my girls how to give to God consistently because they were being stubborn. And then, but I, I, have, I had my own ways about me as well. And, but now he consistently does what? That, you know, now he knows the difference between those who honor God with their money and those who don't honor God with their money. Now she knows because she knows the things that God has done for her. And if you teach your children how to go in the right way, and young people, <laughs> uh, even if your parent is not teaching you the right thing, some of you, you are, you, you are having your first degrees, you, are, you have your, your, your sixth form and so forth, you are old enough, oh. take your own destiny in your hands. <laughs> Don't go and blame your parents. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> so let me quickly show you some principles, and I will bring my, my um, uh, and I, I will cast some of this out and I bring my, the message to a close. You know, and these are, you know, principles that I have coined out of these things that I've been learning about honoring God. The first thing is this. God does no serious business with people who are not serious with him. If you are not serious with God, he will not do business with you. Is that okay? You see, and Jesus went to Nazareth. They didn't believe him. They did not honor him as a, a, a prophet and therefore... He did no miracles. You can read it for yourself. Time will not permit me. Number two, the place God gives to us in his kingdom depends on the place we give to him in our lives. You see, give and it shall be what? Give, give him. Press down, shake him together. You know, running over. So listen, you see, that is the law of the kingdom. The more of yourself you give to God, the more of him he will give to you. And I'm telling you, who is richer than God? You sell yourself short when you limit God in your life. Open your mouth wide, and I will do what? I will fill it. Open your mouth, and God will do what? Fill it. So the extent to which you honor him in your life is the extent to which he will give you his kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all else will be what? Added unto you. Number three, God will never value those who despise him. It's a sure fact. You see that God will never what? Honor those who despise him. The scripture is there. Go and think about it. If you despise him, 
like Elis, Eli and his children did, he would despise you. And I don't want God despising me. It doesn't mean there is no grace. God will give you chances. He will give you chances. And if you keep on abusing the chances, there is going to come a time he will shut the door. Four, if God will not get your attention, you will not get his either. If you want God's attention, then give him what? Attention. And I mean this. You see, if you will not spend time with scripture, if you will not stand, spend time, you know, worshiping God and praying, how can you, even God answers your prayer? How can you know? So the point is this. If you don't give him attention, he will ignore you. Who likes God to ignore him or her? I don't want that. Number six, the condition of your heart is more important to God than your offering. You see, and it's been proven and tested in both Old and New Testament. In the, in the Old Testament is the offering of Cain and Abel. And let us go, let me show you the scripture. Because most of the time we are not attentive to detail. When you read the scriptures, don't rush. Even though we are reading the Bible, we are reading through the Bible in a year, sometimes you must go slow to know and understand the word. Is that okay? So sometimes slow down. Even though Pastor Steve wants you to hurry a bit, you must slow down sometimes. <laughs> Abel also brought of the first fruit, uh, firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected, listen to the, 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 the way the language is here, how the sentence is structured. You know, and the Lord respected Abel. Yeah? And then, and his offering. So there was a, you know, the person behind the offering was accepted before the offering was what? Accepted. And look at Cain. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Cain was rejected because of his, you know, anger attitude. Was rejected by God and therefore his offering was what? Rejected. Because, you see, listen. God is looking at our hearts. He's not looking, you know, at what people see. It, you know, what God sees, okay, it's best you open your heart to him and then let him help you to be the kind of person he wants you to be. So God looks at the heart. And you remember Jesus saying in uh, Matthew, I think, chapter 5, when Jesus says that if you are going to give an offering and as you are going, you remember that somebody has offered offended you. Is that why, what he says? Aha. Uh -huh. Then leave your offering there, isn't it? Yeah. No, he, did, he says that if you have offended someone, uh, yeah, leave your offering there and do what? Go back. Why is he saying that? Because he is looking at the person behind the offering. And your heart is not right. So the offering you bring to the Lord's table is not accepted. So, listen, Anything, I believe that everything in life we do has got to do with an offering to God. And if you are offering anything to God, whether money, your time, everything you are doing, make sure that your life is in sync with the mind and the purposes of God. Hallelujah. God is a generous God. He wants to help us. But you must open your heart to him. What God doesn't like are people who are not transparent. If you are transparent, God likes honesty. If you go to God and say, you tell him, Daddy, this one, I want to, but I, I just don't have the strength, God will do what? He will help you. Oh, I thought somebody would say amen. amen. Your response to God in private will determine how he responds to you in public. You see, sometimes we think that, uh, you know, the children of Eli, they have been, you know, practicing you know, uh, cult prostitution. They have been, uh, you know, messing up with the offerings of God. They have promoted themselves to the extent that they are offending God at every turn. But now, they are saying that when there was a war between Israel and the Philistines, now they, the same people who actually are despising God now go to uh, the tent of meeting 
and they carry the Ark of Covenant to the wall, you know, to the area of the wall. You see, thinking that God does not see. You know, and what happened? Instead of, you know, and sometimes that is what happens. You know, when we are offending God, even people who are supposed to respect us, when they see us, they become very much more stubborn. And we can't push them out of the way. You see, that is why if you want God to fight the devils on your behalf, you must honor him. Because sometimes God allows some of these uh, demons to be around us until they teach us humility. Are you with me? Because they know that, he knows that if he redraws them, you will never be humble. And so he leaves them around to kick you up a bit. Meanwhile, he's protecting you. But if you want God, <laughs> you know, so they took that thing to the war zone. And what happens? The Philistines got their strength. And what did they do? They captured the, even the Ark of Covenant. Listen, you know, if you don't honor God, yeah, if you don't honor God, the things that you think are so precious, are so holy, when you take it out, you know, you remember the sons of Sceva. They were going to cast out devils when they themselves were not respecting God. What happened to them? The, uh, the, the demon possessed man beat them out of their socks and they were running uh, helter scatter. You don't want that to happen to you. Honor God. Hallelujah. Amen. Your response to God in seasons of normality will determine how he responds to you in your moments of emergency. Sometimes we are desperate. You know, we don't respect God in any way. You know, when we come to church, we come when we want. We go when we want. Nobody, <laughs> you know, we are not responsible to anybody. But then you, you know, the same person is sitting in a car and the car is going into a ditch. They are the loudest. Oh, Jesus, help me. It's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> in your moments, you know, when you are not, you are not honoring him, in your normal times, we you know in your desperate moments, God may not look may not look around to help you. And it may sound very tough, but I can only be honest with you. Okay? And look at the scriptures there. Jesus says, my father hears me anytime I lift up my head. Why? Because he honored the father. He pleased the father at every turn. Okay? What you are willing to do for God determines what he does for you. Okay? The scripture is there. You know, uh, sometimes we want to squeeze our money into our own pocket. We do our own projects. We go up our life. You know, we are building in Ghana. We are building here. We are buying property here. The last person we think about is God. And then suddenly, we want God to help us. Hmm? We want God to help us. And sometimes God places us in some corners where money cannot even buy what we want. And then... Have you, have you been in a, you know, a place where money could not actually come to your aid? You know, so please, loosen up. Loosen up. Loosen up every area of your life to God. If you want God to step into every area of your life to help you, then open up every area of your life for God to step in. Very important. The measure of your obedience determines how, you know, intimate you are with God. It's this one, there is no other measurement than this. Jesus says that uh, those who love me will do what? Obey my commands. If you love Jesus, you obey his command. You know, the, what, the measure of how much you love God is the level of your obedience. Is your obedience immediate or suspended obedience? Think about it. And lastly, I just want to, uh, you know, looking at the life of Eli and Somewhere, I want to show you a few things about what happens to those who despise God and end with those, uh, I'm telling you, I will use just a minute to do this, and those who actually honor God. What happens? Those who dishonor God, you know, like Eli and his children, God took away their privileges as priests. Verse 36 of chapter 2. You know, sometimes God can redraw the privileges we have as his children because God does not pamper us. Are you with me? So sometimes he will withdraw his privileges. He cut off the family of Eli from the priesthood line. 
Did you know that Saul, the first of the actions he took was to kill all the priests. Uh, you know, the priests that he killed, all of them belonged to Eli's line. He almost ended them. And the, the few that was left, Solomon, when he came on the throne, changed the priesthood to Zadok. Which, which Zadok was not on the same line as Eli. For, for, so for, for, some eternity, for some time now, Eli and the, his family were obliterated from the line of the high priesthood. God can do that. And when you go read those scriptures, he banished Eli's family from his presence. Wow. Hey, God banished them from his presence, that none of them would stand in his presence. I can't take that. That is too much. And he publicly allowed them to be humiliated. His two children died on the same day, and Eli died the same day. That is why the wife gave, giving birth on the same day, he said, Inkaba, the glory has departed. A shame when you bring shame to God, he despises you. Um, I don't know how, best, how to tell it, but this is a sad situation. But listen. When you promote God, he will also do what? He will promote you. Somewhere grew up in the presence and in the house of God. And he says that those who are planted in the house of God will be like what? Oaks in the house of God. They will be like palm trees in the house of God. They will be fruitful. God will plant you in this church and you will be big, you will be great. If you honor God in this church, you will see that every year God will keep on increasing you. Hallelujah. And like Jesus, you will grow in favor with God and with man. You see, when he says that, it, he's talking about influence. God will increase your influence. You know, you will be somewhere, people haven't heard your name before, God will go and promote you, and before you know it, they are calling you to come and do certain things, and you don't know anything about. Have you heard a story like that? God himself will make you great. He will himself be your advertiser. He will advertise you everywhere he goes. Hallelujah. You want God to be your advertiser? Oh, God, then honor him, and he will honor you. You know, he grew in God's word. You know, when the word of God was being lost, he grew in God's word. And God backed. You know, you look at the scripture, 1 Samuel 3, 19, 20. He says that not a word of somewhere dropped without being backed. God supported the word of somewhere, you know, like his own word. So when someone says that you are dying, you will be dying. When someone says you will rise, you will be dying. You will be rising. That is how God supported the word of someone. May God support and back the word of somebody here in the name of Jesus. And like Jesus, God made someone great. Now Jesus said that we know in Philippians, because Jesus humbled himself, died the death of a slave, a servant, the Bible says that God has lifted him above every name. At the name, at the mention of the name of Jesus, every name must bow, and everybody, you know, uh, you know, bow the knee to the to that great name, to that wonderful name. And why has God done that? Because Jesus was the uttermost in pleasing God. He gave his best to God, and God gave his best to Jesus. You want God's best? The choice is yours. What do you want to be in God's kingdom? You want to be great or small? It comes by honoring God. As taking God as a priority person in your life and seeking to honor him with all your life. God richly bless you and give you the grace to be able to honor God that way. Amen. Can we rise and... Uh, I know that uh, we all, as I was preparing,